I am recording, even though I didn't have my reminder sitting here. So today, uh, some more conservation of momentum problems. I've got a homework assignment for you. I haven't made it the same way so far, but uh, I'll post the, the paper handout for that. It's just one sheet and uh, make that available shortly after class here today. It'll be due Tuesday, the 28th of November, which is actually the last time we'll meet before our final. And uh, anyway, we'll have that. Um, should ask before we get going too far. Oh, I don't have the chat opened yet. Oh, there we are. Um, if anyone has any questions. Anything that popped up? I know you don't have a homework assignment right now, so uh, can't ask questions on that, but I'll be posting that soon anyway. Um, let's see. Well, let's just go ahead and dive into this problem. Sorry the picture on here is so blurry. I don't know what happened to this or where I got it from. Looks like one I might have done done but uh anyway the description is good enough we have a one kilogram block at rest so that's this thing here and it's uh connected to an unstretched spring so it's that spring here is in the equilibrium position and the other end of it is fixed attached to a wall over here or something and we have a two kilogram block that's this thing whose speed is four meters per second. So it's coming in here at 4.0 meters per second. And this is a horizontal frictionless surface. So we don't have to worry about any lost energy or anything like that. And the two blocks stick together after the one dimensional collision so what maximum compression of the spring occurs when the blocks momentarily stop? Okay, this is the first of, um, well, I don't know if it's the first or not, but it's one of those problems where we're going to have to use both conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. And so to begin with, when this two kilogram block collides with the one kilogram block and they stick together, the momentum of this two kilogram block is going to be conserved and immediately after the collision we'll have these two blocks stuck together moving at some new speed. And so what I can say to begin with is now I'll say the initial is going to equal the final and what I'm talking about here is the momentum. Initially, this is all we have for momentum. And so I'll have, um, if I think of this as block one, actually I should call this block two, since it's got two kilograms. And this is block one here. Well, block two is the one that's moving. So initially we'll have M2 V2 initial. That's it for the initial momentum. This one is at rest. And immediately after the collision, those two blocks are going to be stuck together. So I'll have M1 plus M2. And this will be, I'll just call it V final, although it's only final as far as that collision is concerned, because then we get to the second half of the problem. But what we'll end up here is that um, immediately after the collision, that final velocity will just equal M2 over M2 plus M1 times V2 initial. So M2 is two kilograms. M1 is one kilogram. So let's see. So we'll have two over one plus two is three, two thirds of V2 initial is what it ends up being. 
which is, uh, let's see, what is it? Four meters per second. So that's eight thirds of a meter per second, which is uh, about 2.7. To, yeah, we've only got two significant figures and everything. Okay, so now we know how fast these two things are going for the first part here. Now we get to the second part, and this V final that we've got here is actually going to be the combined speed of these two things. Now we're out of the realm of conservation of momentum because we'll have this force of the spring that's acting to stop these things, but we can go to conservation of energy. And initially we'll have a three kilogram mass moving at this particular speed. And so we'll have that kinetic energy. And again, we'll have initial equals final but now we're talking about energy. Up here, we were talking about momentum. The momentum is going to be gone after this thing. It's actually transferred to the wall and the earth that this spring happened to be attached to. And it's gonna be such a tiny transfer compared to the mass of the earth that it's not going to notice. Actually, it'll probably be taken up with uh, just some weird thing happening. The wall might compress a little or something like that. But um, So what have we got? We've got one half M1 plus M2. That's the total mass that's moving times V final squared. Okay, that will be the initial kinetic energy for this second half of the problem. And that will equal, well, where's the energy go? It's gonna go into compression of that spring. And when springs get compressed, the energy that is stored in them is just one half Kx squared. And it's just asking what maximum compression of the spring occurs, okay? so. It'll compress the spring, come to rest instantaneously, and with no friction in the system, those things are going to get pushed back out with the same initial speed. Actually, uh, this one, I think, is attached to the spring. Well, connected to anyway. Yeah, so it may stay put and send the other one on its way. So, but at any rate, unless there's Velcro between the two, but it doesn't say anything about Velcro. So what have we got here? We can just solve for X final and both terms have a one half. I can get rid of that. I can divide by K. And so I'll have M1 plus M2 over K times V final squared. And again, that's actually the initial velocity or speed in this part. And that'll equal x squared. So I may as well plug in the numbers here now. I'll have 3.0 kilograms. That's the combined mass of mass one and mass two divided by, oh, is the final going to be cumulative? Yes, it will. And so it'll start from the beginning and go up through, uh, Let's see, Monday will probably be the last day of uh, momentum. And I think I'm going to skip center of mass this quarter, which is sometimes studied, but um, it's just kind of a standalone little calculation. We don't have to, uh, if you ever take a class where you'll, you'll spend a lot more time studying it than we do like engineering statics or dynamics. And they really do it right. Um, other things, oh, that last week we'll start, we'll do a small unit on rotational motion. And, uh, and you won't have a homework assignment on that last week, but there will be a question on the final about it. So um, 
that's how it goes. Anyway, and we'll have some kind of a review session for the final, maybe one or two. I don't know uh, just how I'll schedule those yet, but uh, that'll be for the future. Okay, anyway, M1 plus M2 divided by K is 210 newtons per meter. times that V final squared here, which is 2.7 meters per second. And that gets squared. And we better check out the units on this thing. Um, up on top, we'll have a kilogram meter squared per second squared. On the bottom, we have a Newton per meter, a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. And I'm dividing it by a meter or multiplying that times one over a meter. And so the meters on the bottom go away and I'll have kilogram per second squared. Uh, let's see, if I flip that and multiply, I'll be multiplying the top by second squared over kilograms. So those are gone from the bottom now. And the second squared go away, the kilograms go away, and I end up on with meters squared, which is good. This is a length squared. So anyway, we can plug those all in. And I get... Point one zero meters squared. So X will equal whatever the square root of that happens to be. About point three two meters, which is thirty two centimeters. So that's a little bit. Okay. Any questions on that one? Don't know what the next one is. Okay. An alpha particle. All right. Uh, mass of four atomic mass units experiences an elastic head on collision with a gold nucleus, mass 197 atomic mass units. That's what the U stands for. I think I have a later problem where I actually tell you what that happens to be, or maybe it's on the homework. Anyway, the gold nucleus is initially at rest. And what fraction of its original kinetic energy does the alpha particle lose? So momentum will be conserved or yeah, momentum will be conserved but we're interested in the fraction of its original kinetic energy that it loses. Well, a couple of days ago, or maybe it was, I don't know what day. I know I recorded an extra video yesterday. So yesterday, actually, I developed an expression when you have a collision between two objects that is elastic. And it was for a one dimensional elastic collision. And I, had the idea that we had a particle one that was coming in here. And I developed it for a situation where you had a particle two that was moving in some direction or the other. Um, turns out the uh, expressions I got, you might have negative numbers on some of these things, but um, this would be V1 initial, and this would be V2 initial. And I developed an expression when you have an elastic collision. And an elastic collision, kinetic energy is conserved. And so what I ended up with was this. And we're going to have be able to make use of this again in the next problem as well. But uh, I had V1 final is equal to M1 minus M2 times V1 initial plus 2m2 times v2 initial, showed up in there. And on the bottom, I had m1 
plus M2. And if mass two happens to be at rest, this part of the term just vanishes for us. And that's the situation that we hear. The gold nucleus is initially at rest. And so what we can say is that B1 final is going to equal M1 minus M2 over M1 plus M2 times B1 initial. Um, let's see, and I think that's it. <clears throat> everything we need to actually solve this problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, well, I think we can just plug in the numbers here that uh, for the alpha particle, B1 final is going to equal M1 minus M2. Its mass is 4U. The gold nucleus is 197U. So 4U minus 197U. And I'm not even going to bother to change these into any other thing because I've got the same units on the bottom. There it's the sum. 4 plus 197 is going to be 201 atomic mass units, and you can see that the uh, atomic mass units are going to divide out there. I'll have V1 final is going to equal minus 193 atomic mass units over 201 atomic mass units times V1 initial, and so it's going to be going mostly the same speed. Now, what fraction of its original kinetic energy does the alpha particle lose? Okay, the amount it loses is going to be the difference between the initial kinetic energy and the final kinetic energy, but it asks for the fraction. So this will be uh, the fraction, which I'll just call lowercase f, I guess will be Ke final minus Ke initial. That's the amount that it actually loses. This will be a negative number, but that's OK. And I'll divide that by Ke initial. Or I could write that as Ke final over Ke initial minus one. And so that might be simpler math wise. So let's just plug in the things and see what we get. Ke final is going to be one half m alpha b one final squared divided by, let's see, Ke initial is going to be one half M alpha B1 initial squared. And then I have a minus one on here. It's going to show up. Well, let's see. B1 final. Actually, I'll cross out things that are common up here. I'll have B1 final squared over B1 initial squared. But B1 final is kind of complicated. So that fraction will end up equaling minus 193 over 201 times V1 initial squared divided by V1 initial squared. I'm making my ones very distinctive. And then I'll be subtracting one. So basically, this ends up being 193 over 201 quantity squared minus one for that fraction. So I didn't have to do any very high-powered math, this was probably the hardest part of the problem to figure out. Um, this, we did the bulk of the work on a previous problem, and I think this is going to be a, a formula that I'll give you, I'll add to the formula sheet, so this will be available. Um, although I don't tend to give quite so complicated problems on tests, but you never know, I could get carried away.
Okay, and I get that it would lose about, um, what I actually get is minus uh, 0 0.078. And actually we don't have that many significant figures, so it'd be more like minus 0 0.08. So we'll skip that one. And if you just think of the absolute value of the fraction that it loses, this would be about 8% of its initial kinetic energy. This kind of an experiment was actually historically important, although at the time it wasn't known what was going on or prior to the experiment uh, in the, let's see, I can't remember. I think it was in about 1908, but I'm not, not positive. It might've been shortly after that. Uh, Rutherford, Ernest Rutherford, was the lab director at a laboratory in, in England. And he had a couple of experimenters doing an experiment where they were taking alpha particles and they were using radium, which decays by alpha emission. And they were aiming it at a very thin gold foil. And at the time, the understanding of the atom or the, it was really just a hypothesis, they knew that atoms were neutral most of the time, but they also knew that electrons could come out of atoms. And electrons had very little mass. Uh, alpha particles had a mass that was about 7,500 times as much as electrons. And so they thought of the atom as just this blob of positive charge. And they didn't know what that blob of positive charge was like, but they thought it was just not dense or anything. It was just spread out through the volume of the atom. And electrons were distributed about in that blob of positive charge, like raisins in a plum pudding. You may have heard of the plum pudding model before. And uh, those electrons balanced the positive charge and made the atom overall neutral. So that was the, the model that Rutherford was testing or having his experimentalists test. And the two experimentalists, one of them was named Marsden and the others was Geiger. And he's the person that the Geiger counter is named after. He later developed that. But anyway, they do this experiment and they're expecting all of the alpha particles to just blow through this gold foil and maybe be slightly deflected. And if they studied the number that they got deflected at different angles, they might learn something about how the positive charge was distributed within those atoms. Well, most of them did plow right through the thing because most of those things would actually, most of the alpha particles would actually either go between the atoms in this very thin foil or they would miss the nucleus, but they didn't know that there was a nucleus to the atom. And what they found was that some of the alpha particles would bounce straight back from a collision. And what they were doing was having a head-on collision with a gold nucleus. And so they'd come in and come back with 92% of their initial kinetic energy. And that was a big surprise. And Rutherford said it was the most surprising thing that ever happened in my life. It was as if you fired a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. So he was surprised. Anyway, um, he worked through the math and figured out what the charge distribution of the, of the atoms had to be. And he realized that there was a tiny dense center at the center of the atom that atom can, or that tiny dense center contained all of the positive charge and 99.9% .9 of its mass. And that was the discovery of the nucleus. Then it was a big deal. So there's a little bit of history for you for today. Rutherford later got a uh, Nobel Prize in chemistry for that discovery. And he said that that was the most amazing transformation that ever occurred in his life, was changing from a physicist to a chemist when he got the Nobel Prize for that. He still thought of himself as a physicist. Okay, here's kind of a fun one. Um, we have 
Um, you may have heard about the gravitational boosts that spacecraft get when they're launched to the outer solar system. And the first ones, maybe not the first ones, but early on in this uh, use of this thing was the Voyager spacecraft that were launched in the mid 1970s to the outer solar system. And Voyager 2, let's see, had a close flyby of Jupiter and then a close flyby of Saturn and then a close by of flyby of Uranus, Uranus, and then later Neptune. And on all of those, we got gravitational kicks. Uh, Voyager 1, I think, just went to Jupiter. And I'm not sure. It may have gotten a gravitational kick from Jupiter and then directed out of the plane of the planets in the solar system. Or it might have gone to Saturn and then had that happen. And I don't remember what the ordering was on that one. But anyway, this is a simplified version of what happened in that, in that case. We're still using this. Um, it's very expensive to send a lot of fuel farther out into the solar system. But if you can get gravitational kicks for relatively little expenditure in fuel, as what would have happened here, then the spacecraft uh, don't have to have such large rockets carrying along, and they just have little maneuvering rockets. So let's find out how this works. We've got uh, this spacecraft approaching Jupiter in the direction opposite its order, or opposite its motion, and it rounds the planet and it departs in the opposite direction. So this is what it actually does here. It comes slingshotting around the planet, and the only force that's acting on this spacecraft during this encounter is the gravitational force of Jupiter. That's what controls it. Now, that's a pretty gentle force, actually. It undergoes a relatively large acceleration here, but it doesn't actually get as close as we've drawn on here. It, uh, it's more like out at the distance of some of Jupiter's moons is about where it might be. And so anyway, it comes slingshotting through here, and we're going to try and figure out what goes on in this case. So we'll start off with a conservation of momentum thing, and we'll assume that um, this would be V Jupiter initial, or maybe I should use a yeah, V Jupiter, I'll just put an I on there. This'll be V Voyager initial. So it's going in the opposite direction. Momentum wise, what we have, and I'm gonna have positive B to the right. So before the collision, what we'll have for momentum is we'll have the mass of Jupiter times its initial velocity which is going to be Vj initial. Voyager is going in the opposite direction. And so I'm going to let this represent its speed, but it's going in the negative direction. So I'll have the uh, mass of, actually a way I can deal with this better is to use a capital M for the mass of Jupiter. Then I might be less likely to screw up later. So anyway, we'll have the mass of Voyager times its initial velocity. And that's the initial momentum. This will equal the mass of Jupiter times V Jupiter final plus whatever the final momentum of Voyager happens to be. So V Voyager final, mass of Voyager, V Voyager final. So that's the conservation of momentum equation. And then we can do something like that for the kinetic energy equation. It's an elastic collision because there isn't anything to steal energy from the system in this case. Uh, maybe some dust moat on the Voyager spacecraft might get lifted off the surface by Jupiter's gravity, and that would take a 
teeny tiny bit of energy out of here, but that's going to be nothing compared to the other energies that we have here. So what we'll have for energy is one half the mass of Jupiter times V Jupiter initial, and that gets squared, plus one half the mass of Voyager times V Voyager initial squared. Well, let's see. And that's the initial kinetic energy. I'll have a, something like that for the final kinetic energy. One half the mass of Jupiter times V Jupiter final squared. Uh, it's not going to fit. Plus one half the mass of Voyager times V Voyager final squared. So that's the conservation of energy equation. Now, the other day I did something like this for a couple of blocks on a frictionless table or something like that. And um, what I did was take this equation, get the Jupiter terms on one side, the Voyager terms on the other, got rid of the one halves. And then I did the same thing with this momentum equation. And I ended up dividing the energy equation by the momentum equation. And I came up with an expression that would, uh, let's see, look like this. Eventually, I would have the mass, Jupiter mass times the mass of Jupiter minus the Voyager mass, mass of Voyager times the, this should have been, oh, that should have been V Jupiter final here. I think, yeah, uh, minus this, the Voyager final, I think, I, yeah, I've got that there, and that will equal the mass of Jupiter times the, let's see, actually, I'm not so sure about what I've got there, um, can't read my writing very well. However, um, we can do a little bit of work on this thing. And what I'd done when I solved that other problem is translated into this one. And I'm going to work through this solution in detail, a whole lot of detail. I don't want to spend a ton of time on it here. But um, the Voyager final will end up equaling mass of Voyager minus the mass of Jupiter times the Voyager initial plus two times the mass of Jupiter times the Jupiter initial divided by the mass of Voyager plus the mass of Jupiter. That's supposed to have a subscript of J on it, but the capital M is supposed to stand for the mass of Jupiter anyway. Whoops, and this would have been a capital M here. Okay, well, um, this is gonna be kind of a, an unbalanced equation, but I'll show you a way that we can get a pretty good approximate solution I didn't give you the masses of Jupiter and Voyager on here, but this isn't much. This is huge. And so uh, we'll be able to do something with that. And I'll actually write, well, may as well write them down here for you. The uh, mass of Voyager, M sub V, is equal to 773 kilograms. Okay, so that's less than the mass of a car right? Unless it's a really light car. The mass of Jupiter is equal to about two, well, it's 1.90 times 10 to the 27th kilograms. So this is uh, about 24 orders of magnitude larger the mass of Jupiter is. So it's a lot more. Well, let's see what effect that has on uh, 
on this expression here. But what I'm going to do is multiply the top and the bottom of this thing by one over the mass of Jupiter. Okay, so doing that doesn't change this expression. It's really multiplying it by one. It's just rearranging terms on here. And so what I'll end up with here is um, I'll distribute it throughout here. And when I distribute it through here, I'll get on the top, I'll have the mass of Voyager over the mass of Jupiter minus one times the Voyager initial. And plus, let's see, just two times the initial speed of Jupiter. Oh, there's something about the way that I did this expression different from that one. Hmm. Yeah, I had the sign buried in the number on that one. So I'm coming out wrong on a direction on here. But anyway, down here on the bottom, I'll have the mass of Voyager divided by the mass of Jupiter plus one. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll have to be more careful about the way I deal with that expression. And I'll, when I do the careful derivation here, this should actually be um, negative, or it'll be a negative number when I multiply through there. But what I have, this is going to be zero. It's 773 divided by uh, 1.9 times 10 to the 27th. So it's really close to zero. And we don't have enough significant figures to keep track of it. But I'm going to do that when I um, work this out in detail. So basically, I've got a one on the bottom. Here, that's also going to be zero compared to that one. I've got a minus one here. And what I'll have here ends up being minus one V Voyager initial. And in this case, V Voyager initial is going to have to be negative. Um, I didn't, uh, anyway, I didn't introduce that minus sign or I introduced it as negative too soon. But then I'll have twice the initial speed of Jupiter. And then on the bottom, I just got a one. Well, the initial speed of Voyager was 12 kilometers per second, but its direction was in the negative direction. So what I'll end up with here is that the final speed of Voyager is going to be 12 kilometers per second plus twice the initial speed of Jupiter, which was 13 kilometers per second. So two times 13 kilometers per second. And then on the bottom, we just got a one. Well, two times 13 is 26 and 12 is 38. So Voyager more than tripled its speed by having that gravitational interaction with Jupiter. Um, this kind of a, a process was repeated when the, oh, I can't remember the name of it right now, but the spacecraft that flew by uh, Pluto back in 2015, I think, on its way out, it was actually the fastest spacecraft ever launched from Earth, <clears throat> at least in, the, in that phase of it. And it only had one close encounter with Jupiter and if its speed got tripled out at the location of Jupiter, like this one did, then it would acquire enough speed to leave the solar system. And it did just from that gravitational, that one encounter with Jupiter. And it got enough to kick it all the way out to Pluto. And since then, it has visited, uh, visited a second object that's out there, a Kuiper Belt object is what they call them. And I think it's actually on its way to have another encounter with another thing out that far. There's a, there are thousands of objects out beyond Neptune, sometimes called trans-Neptune objects that uh, have been discovered. And Pluto fits in very well with those. And that's why Pluto is no longer considered a major planet, but it's 
fits in very well with the trans-Neptunian objects. And uh, anyway, that's um, kind of a neat thing, a good way to give a spacecraft a good kick of speed without expending much in the way of fuel. All it would have to do is just make slight alterations of its course using its maneuvering rockets that hardly use any fuel at all. And it can fine tune an encounter like this one. Uh, let's see, we actually did this one in class the other day, or I finished it on a recording that I did last night and posted. So I'm not going to do that here. Um, this is a more complicated problem. We have an alpha particle colliding with an oxygen nucleus initially at rest. Uh, this time it's an oxygen nucleus, not a gold nucleus. The alpha particle, that's the Greek letter alpha, by the way. And when I write it, I tend to make just something like that. So just so you know. Anyway, scattered at an angle of 64.0 degrees above its initial direction of motion. And the oxygen nucleus which recoils at an angle of 51.0 degrees below this initial direction. Now, this the interaction in this case is going to be purely the electric force that exists between a positively charged alpha particle and the positively charged nucleus of the atom. So it's just going to be an electrostatic repulsion between those things. And the final speed of the nucleus is 1.20 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. What are A, the final speed, and B, the initial speed of the alpha particle? So, and it gives us the mass of the alpha particle is 4u. The mass of an oxygen nucleus is 16u. <clears throat> and again, a u is an atomic mass unit. Well, let me just make a sketch of this situation before we get into it too much. We start off with an alpha particle sailing along here with an initial velocity of V alpha initial. So, and then we have, <clears throat> yeah, scratchy throat today, an oxygen 16 nucleus here. And I'll just stick an O16 on that thing. And it's at rest initially. After the collision, the oxygen 16 nucleus is no longer there. The alpha particle came in along a line like this, but the alpha particle is being scattered at an angle of 64.0 degrees above its initial motion there. So here's our alpha particle and the oxygen nucleus is scattered down here at um, 51 degrees. Oh, with that, and there's the oxygen 16 nucleus going in that direction. Okay, well, momentum is conserved. And initially, the only momentum was in this direction. After the collision, the combined momenta of these two things have to equal that initial momentum. But what that means is, well, I can write, I'm going to call this theta and this angle phi. I can write each of these momenta in terms of what we've got here. And let's see what we can do with it. Um, this will be some V alpha final. This will be V oxygen final. And I'll put arrows on them because they have both magnitude and direction. So the initial momentum is going to be, let's see, I think I'm going to make a coordinate system where X goes in the direction of the original alpha particle velocity and Y is perpendicular to that. So initially I'll have the mass of the alpha particle, its initial speed, and it's just going in the I hat direction. So that's the initial velocity. Now, 
after the encounter or after the collision, I'll have the mass of the alpha particle times whatever its final speed is. And we don't know that one. That's something we're going to try to figure out. But uh, I'll have V alpha final. If it's going up in that direction, it's going to have a component. This is V alpha final. Here's theta. This will be V alpha final cosine theta. And this will be V alpha final sine theta. So I can write this as V alpha final cos theta in the I hat direction plus V alpha final sine theta in the J hat direction. But that's only part of the final momentum. I've also got that of the oxygen nucleus. And so I can do something like that with the oxygen nucleus. I'll have the MO for the mass of the oxygen times the oxygen final cosine of phi. If I draw this thing, here's phi, here's the oxygen final. Going to come down here. And this will be the oxygen final cos phi the oxygen final sine phi. So that's split into two components. So I'll have the oxygen final cos phi in the I hat direction. That's a positive one. But the Y component of that, the oxygen final sine phi is in the minus J hat. Whoops, forgot the J hat minus j hat direction. So that's what I have here. Now, what I have to have is that the i hat components after the collision have to equal the initial i hat components, and the j hat components after the collision have to combine to equal zero, because there is no momentum in the vertical direction before the collision. And Things like this get done in particle accelerators all the time. So let's come back to this thing and see what we can do with that. Those are the two equations that I have to deal with now. Well, I can say that if I just look at the J hat components, I'll have to have that zero is equal to M alpha V alpha final sine theta. minus M oxygen, the oxygen final sine phi. So that's what I have here. Do I know any of these things? Well, yeah, I know theta is 64.0 degrees. I know phi is 51.0 degrees. I know... Let's see, the nucleus final speed is 1.20 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. So the oxygen final is 1.20 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. And in this equation, the only thing I don't know, well, I know the masses of the two things. The only thing I don't know is V alpha final. So this will tell me that. Okay. This is using vectors, using conservation of momentum that we've got here, but it's not as bad as some of the other vector equations we've used, but it's kind of neat stuff to be able to work with. Okay, well, let's see. Let's solve that for uh, the alpha final. Actually, we'll start off with kicking the MO v o f sine phi across and that'll equal m alpha v alpha final sine theta 
And it's just M or V alpha final that I'm after. So if I just divide both sides by M alpha sine theta, and they'll be gone from there. Okay, so V alpha final is gonna equal, well, M oxygen is 16U, M alpha is 4U, and that's four. So I'll have four V oxygen final sine of phi is 51.0 degrees. And I just divide by the sine of theta, which is 64.0 degrees. So I can go oh, and V oxygen final is 1.20 times 10 to the fifth. I can just plug those things in and get a reasonable value um, this four is probably good to two significant figures, maybe three. I'd have to look up more carefully what the masses of those things actually are, but it's probably good to two significant figures, so we can keep that much. We'll have to look at the chart of the nuclides to figure those out. Um, And for the alpha particle, I get about uh, 4.2 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. So it's going a bit more than three times as fast as the uh, oxygen nucleus. Now, we still don't know the initial velocity of the um, alpha particle, but for that, I can just look at the I hat terms here and I'll have, oh, let's see. M alpha V alpha initial is gonna equal M alpha V alpha final cosine of theta plus M oxygen the oxygen final cosine of phi. And the alpha initial, if I divide through by the mass of the alpha particle, I'll get the alpha initial. Well, when I divide this by it, I just get um, the alpha final cos theta plus M oxygen over M alpha have that before, V oxygen final cos phi. So I can just plug in the numbers here now. It's not quite so uh, intimidating. So I'll have 4.2 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. That's V alpha final times the cosine of theta. So cosine of 64.0 degrees. Uh, let's see, plus M oxygen over M alpha is four again, and I'm gonna write it as 4.0 because it's that's pretty good to two significant figures. They're actually pretty close to four and 16 atomic mass units. Um, let's see, the oxygen final, 1.2 times 10 to the fifth, meters per second, and I multiply it by the cosine of 51.0 degrees, and I need more room to finish this off. Um, here. Uh, oh, I have to calculate now.
Whoops. Hope I closed off that. Okay, I get about 4.8 times 10 to the fifth for V alpha initial. Two fifth meters per second. So we figured out both parts of that. And a two dimensional problem ends up being doable, but we have to uh, write a two dimensional equation for the conservation of momentum. And what you can do if you have a two dimensional equation like this is set the left hand i hat terms equal to the right hand i hat terms. The left hand j hat terms, which was zero in this case, equal to the right hand j hat terms. And with those two equations, just for momentum, you can figure out two unknowns. And so now something we haven't done here is figure out if this is an elastic collision, but it probably is uh, when you have nothing but the electric repulsion between these things acting. Um, well, one place that energy can vanish to is if the uh, if that electric force gives enough of a kick to one nucleus or the other that protons or neutrons get raised to higher energy levels in there, then that can steal energy from the kinetic energy. But uh, nuclear energy levels are pretty strong or a long ways between them, and it's not so easy to excite. So, okay, um, that's enough for this week. Again, I'm going to record a really careful solution of this problem, or maybe just work it out on paper and post it. And I'll also be posting a, um, a new homework here very soon. So you can be seeing that over the weekend. And then I'll probably, actually, I'm tempted to have you do that one on paper completely. So, um, and just turn it in that last Thursday of class. I could handle that. Okay. Uh, any questions on these things we've done today? The problem's get more complicated and then I end up talking a whole bunch about history of physics and taking up time but uh, we did get through a few and this two-dimensional problem is a big deal to be able to write those things out so all righty if there are no questions I think I'll stop the share here and end this and you all to have a nice weekend.